Hello and welcome to WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter. Joining us in the studio is State Representative for District 63 in Indiana, Mark Mesmer. Mark, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for the invitation once again. Always a pleasure to be here. Well, we always enjoy having you here, and it's been quite quite a while since you've been here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to talk about some things that have happened over the, the summer with the legislature, mm -hmm. and then what are things people can look forward to. But before we get to that, the governor was at the uh, Jasper Chamber of Commerce uh, annual meeting and just really praised the legislature legislation uh, that was passed this past year that was, was very pro-business and is moving Indiana in the right direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it makes it easier for him. He's a Republican in the, the House, obviously, is a re Republican, too. That makes it easier to get the things done that they want to get done. But he, he really, I think, genuinely feels that there were things that were done to help Indiana. Oh, absolutely. And, and some, of the, some of the significant things that we got accomplished this past session, which are going to be huge for this year and, and huge for several years to come. I mean, we, we, we made some, some structural changes to, and one of the, you know, he talked about, you know, four key things that, you know, that he saw as, as things that we need to do as a state. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, is, is a huge part of, you know, you, you create a good jobs climate, you know, by having a, a, a competitive tax base, which we are one of the top one, two, three tax base states. I think he said we were ranked by one of those groups as the second best tax mm -hmm. climate in the country. And, and that's a great, great position to be in. You know, what, and, you know, but what I continue to ask during my study committees is, you know, where are we when we started, when I started, where are we now, and what do we take to be number one? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but we're, we're making, you know, great strides. We eliminated the inheritance tax. We cut our, uh, in, uh, our individual tax rates. We cut our corporate tax rates. We cut our banking tax rates. We've done all these things. Um, but in the process even of doing, implementing a $600 million tax cut this past session, we were able to raise spending for schools, for roads, you know, education, that was another big key, uh, and, and infrastructure. And, and one of the most key things we did was took, the, you know, there's an 18 cents excise tax on fuel per gallon. And uh, we were taking 12 cents of that for decades and spending it on road maintenance and new construction and six cents of that and spending it for Bureau of Motor Vehicles, the license branch, you know, and, and state police operation, which are really overhead items. You know, but they, somebody way back when thought, you know, when there was more gas tax money coming in than they could spend, they, they, they made that change a couple decades ago and, and now it was leaving us short. So we took all of that 18 cents and it's all going to, to maintenance for new road, I mean for, so every county, every city, uh, the, the uh, NDOT, all got about a 35% increase per year in their maintenance budgets. That's a pretty good, mm -hmm. pretty good shot. And I, had, I have had every mayor and every commissioner from every county I represent that I've seen over the past six months just out and about in the communities, you know, thank us for that, I mean that move alone is do or die for, you know, for many of them. I mean, they've got miles, ten, you know, 18, 20, 30, you know, um, miles of, of road paving they need to try to do every year. They usually have hundreds of miles of roads to maintain in every county. And, and they were just not able to make it happen. They were already cash strapped and, yeah. and now that's been changed. Yeah, so that, you know, <coughs> huge education, uh, road funding, um, and part of that road funding mix, we also are taking 20% of the sales tax that's collected on the sale of gasoline and, and putting that to $200 million per year of new road money. How are we going to get that I-69 project paid for from Bloomington to Indianapolis? And we kept hearing from the Bloomington guys who were opposed to, well, you got this road plan, but you don't have any way to pay for it. You know, be patient, fellas. Well, we, we've got $200 million for as long as the eye can see, of new new construction money that'll be able to, you know, to go towards, you know, I-69, I-67 that mm -hmm. we in Southern Indiana hope to see, you know, not too far distant future, uh, US-31 that runs from Indianapolis up to South Bend, basically, you know, the northern, you know, part of the state split, and they've been building that to interstate grade, uh, you know, all those infrastructure improvements that we need to do. Because you always take that and then you put the federal dollars on top of that by a, you know, usually a three to one to four to one match. So you've got, you know, you've got hundreds of millions of dollars of, of money now that we've 
we've been able to, to, you know, to stabilize into the future for new construction. So if Indiana is able to commit more new money to new roads, we can the federal government can match more. Yeah. Can match yeah, they'll, they'll, more. Only match with, yeah. mm -hmm. they'll only match what you put in. Mm -hmm. If you've got $50 million to put in, you'll get $200 million. If you've got $200 million to put in, you know, because a lot of states don't have the, I mean, most states don't have the capital. Mm -hmm. But Indiana do does. It. We yes. do. Well, now you mentioned study committees, which, which is really the work that is done over the summer by the legislature. Yep. Uh, so what are some things that have, have been discussed and we should be looking for in the, in the short session of the legislation that comes up starting in January? Okay. Well, I work on, I was chairman of the Economic Development Study Committee. I'm chairman of the Economic Development Small Business Committee in the House, and I'm chairman of the study committee uh, for that. And, and we spent August, September, and October meeting about every week or two and talking about here again, what policies are we, you know, what do we have in place? Where's the next hurdle we need to knock down? Uh, we talked to business leaders from across the state. We talked from community leaders. We talked, we, we, got, we got assigned a few issues that I wasn't real sure how they were economic development issues, but maybe, maybe we just, just drew the short straw, I don't know. <laughs> One of them was, uh, uh, was on residential leases and, and inspection programs. And we heard the good points of it from the cities and towns that have it. We heard the bad points from some people who are using provisions of that to bypass, you know, tax caps and other things. So I don't know what'll be uh, what'll come out of that bill, but um, the, we did discuss it in, in quite length uh, at one week, one of our weeks. Uh, we talked about trespass on ag property, which I guess if it if it's detrimental to the ag industry, you know, could be, you know, a an, a regressive, you know economic development issue. Uh, don't know that anybody on our committee will, will author the bill for that, but there's folks from Farm Bureau and, and people on the Ag Committee, which is probably the Ag Study Committee is probably where that should have went. But uh, we had some good discussions on that about the impact of trespass and illegal trespass and what the penalties should be for that. And there'll be, there'll be something that'll come out of that bill, uh, probably by one of the authors from last year. We'll bring it back modified. Uh, and and they, they had a dealing with other things of, of videoing and, and illegal videoing. And you know, once you get into the videotape side of the argument, then you get into First Amendment mm -hmm. difficulties. So you know, freedom of speech and, and so we're, I mean, it, we probably won't allow that bill to go down that direction as it had you know, been you know, um, moving through last session, but that, that'll get cleaned up a little bit. Um, some issues we did, did did deal with that were very pertinent. One was rural economic development. And we talked about uh, the <laughs> Lieutenant Governor had a bill a couple years ago that she filed and we'll bring that back in, in some modified form to allow local, you know, to allow counties, because you know, one of the biggest challenges for rural areas is, is lack of broadband access. Mm -hmm. I mean, broadband is the, inter I mean, is the interstate of the 21st century. I mean, we've got to have roads. I think we've all come to realize the key, you know, to, to, you know, to jobs growth and business growth, you know, to good infrastructure. But almost as important or as important is, is access to broadband. And one of the, one of the mechanisms we, she had authored on that bill, and we'll, it'll get brought back through our discussions on our committee, is uh, allowing counties to, to set up what they call tax increment financing zones you know, maybe the whole county be a tax increment financing zone to, to help recapture some taxes that are collected, you know, state sales tax and state income tax, not new taxes, but when you have growth in those tax bases to capture part of that to keep in the county, and, and we want to make it specifically for, you know, to, to make it very, very niche that if you're going to do that, you're going to use it to extend broadband in your county. Okay. Um, it's, it's huge for everybody. And so, those are the TIF. TIF. Okay. That's use of TIF for that. Um, TIF has got good, you know, you know, good utilization. I, most of the counties that use it, most of the cities that have used it, have have had you know great positive experience with it, um, and, and you know I would expect to continue that. But allow a tweak of that to be if you you know if you do a countywide TIF and you know that we, we make it specifically for you know infrastructure uh, enhancement. So uh, that was one of our key bills. Another one we talked about was farm wineries. Up until 2006, the state of Indiana, if you had a farm winery, you had basically unlimited ability, I mean only limited by you know, how far you wanted to drive a truck, um, to sell to grocery stores, uh, liquor stores, 
restaurants, you know, in your geographic footprint of your farm winery to help get your to get your brand built up, to get your volume built up, to, you know, to help you grow. Well, in 2006, one of the nationwide um, wine dealers uh, was a pretty influential lobbyist and was able to convince the legislature in 2006 that that somehow that was a threat to the you know to the to his business, mm -hmm. um, and and. So they crafted up a bill that, that basically eliminated farm wineries' ability to sell, you know, outside of their, you know, outside of their, I mean, to, to, to sell to nobody. Now, if you go to their, to their winery, you can buy what you want, but they can't, you know, they can't take it to, you know, the retail restaurant establishments uh, as of 2006. And there was a lot of farm wineries that were in the pipeline. I mean, when you start a farm winery, it takes three or four years to get your vineyards Volume, sure. grow, you know, growing enough to where you're even making the first gallon of wine. Mm -hmm. Well, so those folks who came on, you know, just prior to 2006, dozens of them across the state, you know, now had a business model that changed, you know, where they've got millions of dollars invested in property and plants and buildings and equipment, and you know, not now. It stopped. And and now, so it's really made it hard. I mean, most of them have have continued to, you know, to trudge along and 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 uh, grow their business, you know, ever so slowly. But we wanted to, uh, and we came out, we, I mean, we're not, we didn't specify the exact amount. We talked about it in the committee of 2,500 to 5,000 gallons of self-distribution, uh, you know, ability, uh, you know, per winery per year, you know, to allow them to get to a point where now, you know, now their only mechanism is to, to line, you know, to try to match up with the statewide wholesaler. No, when you when you're just just dealing with you know small quantities, no no statewide distribution you know outlet wants to mess with you. Mm -hmm. So getting up to a point where you know where then some of those other wholesale channels are are you know workable for the wholesaler and the you know and the winery um, you know comes into play. But you know so that that was that was a one of our big discussions, and we did agree that, that self-distribution does need to be open to, you know, to a limited amount to those folks. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Mark Mesmer. Now, there is a lot to discuss with Mark Mesmer. He's got more to talk about, so we're going to have him back again tomorrow night right here on 18 WJTS. Our guest on this edition of WJTS Inform has been Mark Mesmer, State Representative for District 63. Tune in again at the same time tomorrow night, and we'll hear Mark talk more about what has happened over the summer and what we can look forward to in the short session of the legislature. Mark, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Bill. I'm Bill Potter, thanking you for watching WJTS Inform. We are local people watching local people.